Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Louise. I'm part of the staff team here at St. Catharines, and it's lovely to be here with you all. Um, so last week, um, we kicked off our new series, which is called The James Project. Now, this is much, much more than just a teaching series. Um, this, you know, our hope for this is that it will be a project that we can all take on together as we study the book of James and engage in its contents in a deep and meaningful and practical way. Hopefully, you will all have been able to grab one of these uh, last week um, or today. If you haven't got one, please do grab one. There's a few at the back, um, or you can find them online at stcatherines.ie. Um, we want to use the book of James over these coming weeks to challenge ourselves in our everyday lives. We want to pray it, we want to memorize it, we'd love you to bring specific questions around it to your kitchen table, we want to suggest ways that perhaps you could demonstrate your faith through actions that bless others. Like Shane said last week, our, we don't want to just study the Bible, but we want to let the Bible study us. There's lots of encouragement in this book, there's also lots of challenges in how we live our everyday lives, but this book invites us to grow. And we wanna to continue to change, don't we, into the likeness of Christ ever more. Um, so please do get online, have a look at the daily, weekly resources, and let us know how you're getting on with them. So last Sunday, Shane did an incredible job giving us the backdrop to the book of James and taking us through the first chapter. We learned that James was the brother of Jesus, that he wrote this letter to believers who were now dispersed from um, where they were. Many of them were facing trials, others were wandering away from their faith. One of the key themes that came through certainly for me from last week was how James acknowledges the trying times that we face and he urges us to consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. That's challenging, isn't it? To choose to face the hard stuff joyfully. But I really loved how Shane unpacked that and how he suggested that our tests become our testimonies. It's so true as I sat and I reflected with that and thought back on my own life and you know, the difficult times I've been through, but yet it has been through those times of adversities that I have come closest to God. They're the times that God grew something greater in me. The hard thing may not have been taken away, but with God I was bigger than it. His resources in me equipped me for it. And like a muscle that grows against resistance and grows in strength, I have grown and gained as a result of my reliance on him. So last week was a great reminder that how we handle our now will dictate the kind of story that we tell in the future. And I am grateful that I can testify to God's faithfulness and his goodness in my life again and again and again, and that is the story I wanna tell for the rest of my days. Before we go on, let me just pray. God, you are so good. Thank you that you are here. Thank you that you are watching over us right now with love. Lord, let us be open to your word this morning, allowing it to be both salt and light, allowing it to challenge us, but also give us the ability to receive the encouragement in it and bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I'd love to do with you for the rest of our time together is talk generally about the main theme that threads all the way through the book of James and then hone in more specifically uh, to chapter two, which looks at two specific topics, which are showing favoritism and showing off your faith. As I made my way through the book of James, there's five chapters in it, what really jumps out is the number of themes that James covers and the diverse content in it. 
It's as though James has a certain number of colored balls in a bag and he'll take out a red ball, talk about it and then replace it back in the bag. He'll then take out a green ball, chat about that for a little while, put that back in the bag and then he'll take out the red one again. And he does this randomly throughout the book with different themes, touching on them here and there um, at different times. But I think as I read through the book, the overarching idea through everything, through all of these smaller themes and topics is perseverance. Persistence in doing something that's sometimes difficult. Two of my girls were helping out last week in children's ministry with Taylor and they were also looking at the book of James and when we just started discussing it during the week, the language that they had picked up for persevering was being determined, which I loved and I found really helpful. And when we apply these words of perseverance, persisting, being determined to the themes that James talks about throughout this book, we see that he is encouraging a scattered people to be determined in their faith, to keep believing, to keep asking for wisdom, to keep persevering in humility, to keep listening, to keep choosing peace over anger, even when it's difficult to keep looking in the mirror and confessing those things that distance us from God, to persist in feeding on his living word, filling ourselves with it daily, even when we don't feel like it, to persist living it out in the places we find ourselves, to persist in guarding our hearts and looking after others, to keep on going to persevere in loving our neighbors, to be determined in showing mercy in taming our tongue and using our words to build people up and not tear them down, to keep going, keep doing all of these things. And the encouragement isn't just in one thing. It's persisting in all things that make up and characterize our faith. Our faith is the bag and it holds all of the different colored balls within it. And each needs to be held and taken out and looked at and intentionally chosen on an ongoing basis. We need to be determined every day. Keep going in our faith in all of its incredible ways, each of its many, many facets keep replicating the character and life of Jesus. What could that kind of perseverance in your everyday faith look like? What could that look like for you? Is it being determined to acknowledge God in your day? Is it being determined to take the time to open up the Bible on a regular basis and get that spiritual food into you? Is it persisting in taking a moment before you start your day to get on your knees and surrender again to God? Is there something in your life that you know is not God's best for you and needs a persistent no? Could you persevere in praying for five minutes every day for a friend that is struggling? Could you be determined in kindness and offer your time, your resources, your skills, and bless someone with them? Could you persevere in being a hope-filled voice in the negative conversations that you come across in the week? Perhaps I can suggest that we need to persevere in all of these things and so much more. And this is the message of James to be determined in having a generous faith. The Christian faith is filled with richness and abundance and we have been given the privilege of carrying it, of inviting others into it and giving away the blessing of it. That's what we get to do. It's a privilege. So as we come from that great big central theme of perseverance, which we find all the way through the book of James, 
If we look more specifically into chapter two, James hones in on these two key areas. The first are his thoughts around showing favoritism, and the second is about showing off your faith through your actions. Let me read just a little from James chapter two. Um, If you have it on your phone, you can scroll through with me. Uh, Just starting at James two verses one to four and then skipping eight to nine. He starts with, my brothers as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. Same as as Shane pointed out last week, just how he greets um, his brothers and sisters in Christ, acknowledging his family, that we're all in this together, that we're all human and limited and broken. And we learned last week as well that that James struggled himself from his own times of, of disbelief. But here he's greeting them and reminding them that we have this solid platform to come back to, to remember again who we are and whose we are. He says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Skipping to verse eight. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law, as lawbreakers. The message is loud and clear. God does not like favoritism. Now James was speaking into a specific time where people were suffering opposition, they were experiencing difficulties that were testing their faith, some were falling away from their faith. And one of the commentaries suggests that at the time there was limited agricultural land to support the growing population. Rich landowners had the upper hand. They had power to take land, to show discrimination when hiring laborers and take advantage of those who were vulnerable. Others saw an opportunity to make money as traders and a class of wealthy merchants emerged. And this all affected the church which was in poverty, so it wasn't uncommon for resentment to brew against the rich as Christians increasingly felt threatened by them. Yet, if a wealthy person visited or belonged to the church, they would still be inclined to show them favoritism and bend over backwards for them at all costs, avoiding offending them and certainly not challenging their behavior they would give them preferential treatment in the hope of gaining from them. And so this is what James is addressing. James is asking his brothers in Christ, why are you treating others based on externals? Sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? Well, I'm certainly feeling guilty of that for sure. He asks them, why are you favoring someone who is rich and ignoring the poor? Have you forgotten that we are all equal in the eyes of God? Have you forgotten the call to help the vulnerable and those in need? He spells it out for them. You are judging someone on how they first appear and basing your treatment on them from how they look, from their title, their class, their wealth, You're giving special attention to the rich when they are the very ones who are exploiting you. And you are treating the poor like they have less value because they can do less for you. Jesus, through his life, his death and resurrection, broke down so many barriers between Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, Greek and barbarian, slave and free men and women. He brought an even playing field where there was no hierarchy, no special attention based on externals. And James is reminding them that God is an impartial God, that he loves everyone equally, that he looks not at outward appearances, but at the heart. In Deuteronomy 10, 17, it says, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, 
the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribes. God doesn't like favoritism. He doesn't like when we are biased towards someone because of what we see on the outside. James is telling us don't be partial because God isn't partial. And Jesus is just like God. In Matthew 22, 16, the disciples say to Jesus, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Jesus did not judge from externals and neither should we. God's people are to live in a way that reflects his character and his kingdom. And we are to follow the royal law, the law of love, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. If you show favoritism, you sin and are a lawbreaker. There, I've said it. The dreaded word sin, if you grew up Catholic like me, it just has so many connotations to it. But the reality is, is we are all guilty of this because we are not Jesus. And so James is saying here that with favoritism, we are stepping outside of the kingdom, outside of the very thing that Jesus died on the cross for, love the highest priority of heaven, the top priority of the gospel, love. And if we are judging, we are not loving. Myself and my husband used to run um, a bullying awareness program in primary schools called Rugga Kids, and we used tag rugby as the vehicle to teach and demonstrate key messages And although it wasn't a a Christian program per se, we did write it as people of faith inspired by God's word, and in particular inspired by the book of James, in terms of two themes. The first was a, a lesson all around equality, which is basically not showing favoritism, and second, the power of our words. But one of the key goals in terms of what we were trying to achieve in these schools was rather than spending time focusing on the problem and honing in on the ins and outs of bullying, we found that if we focused on the opposite, if we worked on helping create a positive culture in the school where teamwork was prioritized, where everyone celebrated that we were all different but we were all equal, and where everyone acknowledged the power of their words and the ability that they had to build people up with them. Then, if we were doing these things, there would be no place, no foothold for bullying. An increase in one would cause the other to diminish. And the gospel is encouraging us to do the same. Yes, James absolutely blatantly names the serious issues that are going on amongst God's people, and he names them as sin. But he is saying, remember, it's all about love. If you are loving your neighbor as yourself, then bias or prejudice or preference won't exist. There will be no room for it. Be generous in loving others because love conquers all. It's literally more powerful than anything we encounter. I always think of an incident myself and Graham had some years back as we headed for an evening out and we were at the the Lewis station near our home. And this girl was begging and she was mooching around the station Um, around people and asking for money and eventually she made herself her her way over to us and Graham as he always did just started to engage with her and chat with her and she immediately just started calling him this random bloke's name over and over started shouting at him this anger just rose up in her she just saw red to the point where he literally had to hold her off with one hand as she swiped and tried to hit him and was spitting at him, so angry, calling him this name over and over again. I admit I was a little terrified, but Graham just in his way strongly and confidently 
held her back and just looked straight into her eye and said, it's okay, everything is okay. He said, I see you, I see you, I see you. And he kept saying that over and over and over again, literally until she just crumbled and literally fell into his arms sobbing. And this story is just always a reminder of the importance of giving that special attention to everyone no matter what. I get emotional telling it because it's just this beautiful picture of looking with love. Looking inside of someone beyond all of the junk that the the world layers upon us, upon people, that outer stuff that often isn't our own choice or our own doing. Love disarms, love heals, love quietens, love breaks through love isn't always easy but james encourages us to be determined in trying to do it anyway because love is powerful how can we respond in love and i think first we need to do that for ourselves how can we look at ourselves with love How can we look to others with love, to strangers with love? And I just feel this morning like God wants us to bring love to the fore again. I know for myself, as so many other things build up between busyness and schedules and a million other stuff, perhaps like me, you too can use this moment as a reminder from God to prioritize his love again in all that we do. To agree again with heaven that love should always be the first filter in everything. Maybe you could just take a moment between yourself and God just to say yes again to that, to God's love for you. Just take a minute to let it come to the fore again. To finish, I just want to briefly touch on the second main point in chapter 2, and it's pretty much summed up in chapter 2, verse 17, which says, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. In verse 18, it says, show your faith by what you do. And for me, this second point ties in with what we have just spoken about. It ties in with everything that Shane spoke about last week. Our faith should produce generous, radical, godly living. And my encouragement to you this morning is to show off your faith. And I don't mean get on a box and stand on the street corner with a megaphone or tell every person you meet your testimony if you end up doing that, good for you. But I mean show off the generosity that God has shown you. Show off the grace that he has shown you. Show off the peace that you carry that transcends all understanding. Tell people where you found it and that it's not your own. Let your faith cause you to be determined, a determined light bringer into this broken and hurting world. Be a living example of the love of Jesus through your actions. And I do speak to that little voice, perhaps in your head, which says, I'm not good enough, I'm not holy enough, I'm not qualified enough. I need to be more like so and so, or I need to be reading more of my Bible. There's always a reason. There's always a reason that we're not good enough. And I've said this before, but all you can do is take what you have in the place that you find yourself and do something with it. Keep it simple. We can all do that. My prayer for you this morning is that you will be determined in doing that. I was reminded during our prayer time this morning, Ephesians 3, just that phrase, out of his glorious riches. Out of his glorious riches just kept coming to me. We give from what he has first given us. Out of his 
glorious riches, not our own. There's an amazing story of perseverance that I just wanted to finish with about an Australian farmer called Cliff Young. I don't know if any of you have heard about him. He competed in the 1983 Sydney to Melbourne ultramarathon, a distance of 875 kilometers, which is, I think, about 550 miles. Anyway, it's a very, very, very long way. He was 61 years of age when he competed. And uh, it, it, it's one of the most grueling racing competitions in the world. And he arrived ready to compete in his overalls and his wellies, in his work gear. And the first thing he did was he took out his false teeth because he said they rattled when he ran with them. His training wasn't like the other athletes who were, you know, in their ASICs gel runners and their quick drying Nike Lycra. Um, but his training was from a lifetime on the farm that he had grown up on. And the only way um, there was to round up all of the 2,000 sheep on the, the 2,000 acres was to run after them. There was no four-wheel drives. They had no horses. So before running the race, he told the press that he had run for three days straight rounding up sheep because of a storm and he had done it in his wellies and this race would only be a couple of extra days and he'd be grand. So off they set and all of the other racers fire on ahead and Cliff just shuffles at a slow steady pace. Night comes and all of the other competitors lay down for some sleep because that's what you do in an ultra marathon. You run 18 hours, you sleep six for the guts of a week. But in the dark of night, the 61-year-old keeps shuffling along. He knew no different. He didn't even know he was meant to stop. That's what he would do on the farm through the night. He would just run and run and run in his wellies. As the others slept, he kept going at his slow, steady pace for five days, and he ended up beating all of the other highly trained athletes by 10 hours breaking all of the previous records by two days. It's a true story. It's amazing, isn't it? That reminder to take what you have in your every day and run with it. No matter what gear you have on, no matter what you show up in, the slow, steady run of persevering faith towards Jesus brings us freedom. It brings us purpose and it brings us a secure destination. Hebrews 12, one to two says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. <laughs>